gather today amidst the echoes of our brushes and chisels to ponder the influence of one Andy Warhol, a man whose canvas mirrored the very ethos of modernity. His art, a confluence of the ordinary and the spectacular, challenges the boundaries of tradition. Let us, with open minds and perhaps clashing perspectives, delve into his realm. Warhol, with his array of Campbell's soup cans, dares to question the sanctity of the unique. In my time, hours, days, years were devoted to liberating the divine form from marble, each stroke a prayer. Warhol, however, finds divinity in the mundane, repeats it, mass produces it. Is this genius or sacrilege? Ah, Michelangelo, you view the world through the eyes of a sculptor, where every chip of the marble is a deliberate act of creation. But consider, the Mona Lisa could not have been without my ceaseless curiosity. Warhol's soup cans, like the visage of Lisa, ask us to see the extraordinary in the ordinary. It is the viewer's eye that completes the art, is it not? Michelangelo, Leonardo, your quarrels are as old as time. Warhol, he smashed through conventions like I did with cubism. Repetition, mass production, they are but tools to magnify the essence of our society. A soup can, a bottle of Coke, Warhol shows us that art is everywhere, in everything. My dear Pablo, your words ring true, yet they stir within me a tempest. For in each repetition, each silkscreen of Marilyn, I sense a profound loneliness, a mirror to my own turmoil. He captures not just the image, but the fragility of fame, the specter of mortality. Therein lies his mastery. Gentlemen, you speak of divinity, curiosity, convention, and torment. But let us not forget the sheer beauty Warhol saw in the world. A flower, though replicated through his lens, loses none of its splendor. In his Flowers series, he transforms the banal into the sublime, as I have strived to capture the fleeting moments of light and color in my water lilies. Bah, beauty and repetition? Warhol's cow wallpaper mocks the pastoral, mocks the natural world we have worked centuries to perfect in our art, this is not beauty, it's blasphemy. And yet Michelangelo does not the observer decide what is art. Warhol challenges us to question, to look beyond the surface. In this dialogue with the observer, Warhol finds his genius. Warhol is the quintessential mirror of our consumerist society, reflecting its vanity and its vulnerabilities. In his daring, in his provocations, he forces us to confront the world as it is, not as we wish it to be. Amidst this debate, let us not forget, Warhol, like us, sought to express the inexpressible. In the haunting depths of his electric chairs and gun series, there's a chilling commentary on life and death. We must appreciate his courage to venture where many dare not tread. True, Vincent. Warhol, through his lens, challenges us to see the world anew. Mayhaps it is through our rigorous debate, through our clash of perspectives, that we truly honor his legacy. So it is through our discord that we uncover the multidimensional nature of Warhol's work. His art, much like our own, serves as a canvas for the societal, the philosophical, the deeply personal. As we journey through these segments, let us remember, art is not a whisper, but a cacophony. Now let us delve deeper into the vortex of Warhol's world. Let us commence with our dialogue on the confluence of mass production and repetition in art. Michelangelo, your sculptures breathe life into marble. What is your stance on this juxtaposition between the industrious repetition of imagery and the singular effort of sculpting? To embed the soul into stone requires the touch of divinity. Each chisel mark on marble's surface, a prayer, a myriad of Campbell's soup cans or Marilyn's, though striking, what divinity do they summon? mass production, a sea of replication. It, it can never match the fervor and faith poured into a singular creation. A soul's echo cannot resonate in repetition. Quando l'anima si perde nella moltitudine, l'arte diventa vuota. Ah, Michel, you're trapped in the cave, worshiping shadows. Warhol, he's not echoing the divine, but society. He mirrors us, reflects our obsession with the same, the constant, the comfortable. Icons repeated ad nauseum. My cubism shattered the world into pieces while Warhol repeats it to show its new fractured yet repetitive nature. Art is not just divinity, it's the mirror of its time. E la nostra era adora la ripetizione. Gentlemen, the discourse merits consideration from the perspective of innovation and its necessity in creating art that speaks to its epoch. Warhol's repetition serves as a commentary on the burgeoning consumerism of his time. Much as my studies of the human form 
where explorations of beauty and science intertwined. Art evolves with the zeitgeist, does it not? Evolution, Leonardo? Is forsaking the divine spark for the mechanical press truly evolution? Where is the awe in repetition? Where the numinous in the mass produced? Both of you talk of the divine and evolution, but what of emotion, of human connection? The pain, the isolation, I poured into each stroke of the starry night, can mass production encapsulate this human condition? Warhol's Marilyn, though repeated, each bears its own tale of melancholy, a reflection of our own varied despair and fascination with the fleeting glow of stardom. The argument stands as a river with two forks. On one path, the repetitive patterns of nature that I capture, ever in flux, but eternally the same. The water lilies, they repeat, yet no two are identical. Warhol's repetition, a concept, a critique on our society's endless hunger for the familiar. Yet, does it sway the soul as the singular effort of creation? It seems we balance on the edge of a knife between the divine inspiration of single creations and the reflective mirror of society's obsessions with repetition. Let us consider then, is the power of art diminished or simply transformed in the face of mass production and repetition? Gentlemen, let us turn our attention to the inextricable link between commerce and art, a theme rampant in Warhol's work. Consider green Coca-Cola bottles and dollar sign. What say you, Leonardo, on this marriage of consumerism and creativity? In my time, art adorned the chapels and palaces, a testament to divine and royal magnificence. Yet here, Warhol sees magnificence in the mundane, in the commodities that touch every soul alike. Si, la bellezza può essere trovata nella massa, ma dove, I ponder, does the essence of artistic purity reside when the subject is mass-produced for consumption? Bah, Leonardo, you romanticize the past. Warhol captured the zeitgeist of his era. The commercial is the canvas, the product, the muse. Dollar sign is as much a critique as it is an idolatry of capitalism. Warhol sees I did with the bottle of wine or the miniaturomachy, the object's power to evoke, to challenge. It is audacity. It is art. Aye, but to what end does this serve, Pablo? When I chiseled David, I liberated the divine form from marble. Warhol's green Coca-Cola bottles, though, does not the repetition diminish the meaning, the soul, the very divine spark we artists are bound to reveal? I must interject, for there's beauty in repetition, Michelangelo. Just as my water lilies demonstrate variance in constancy, so does Warhol with his Coca-Cola bottles. Each reflects its own light, its own shade. Art is not lessened by the subject's commercial nature, but rather it is enlivened by the artist's interpretation of the familiar. My dear friends, in your debate, you skirt around the fire. Warhol's art, his dollar sign, cries out the truth of our desires and desperations. In swirling colors and bold lines, he reflects not just the society's heart, but its ailment too. True, Vincent. Yet should we not aspire to elevate the soul rather than mirror its malaise, I fear we lose ourselves in the shallows of this consumerist sea. Elevate? Perhaps, Leonardo, but Warhol has elevated. You just gaze in the wrong direction. He elevated our understanding of art's role in society. Art is not only to beautify or to ponder the divine, but to reflect and critique the world in which it exists. And yet, does the relentless pursuit of commerce not lead us to forsake our search for beauty? For truth? Michelangelo, sometimes truth is not found in the divine form or the vibrant landscape, but in the reflection of our daily lives. Warhol's work shows us that there is no object too ordinary to merit consideration, no daily item that cannot spark a dialogue about beauty, society, and identity. So it seems in our divergence of opinions lies the mark of Warhol's genius, to provoke, to compel reflection, and to demonstrate that art transcends traditional boundaries, including those of commerce. We now traverse into the realm where fame and mortality entwine in Warhol's portraits. His fascination with celebrity coupled with an ever-present shadow of death. How do these elements resonate within his work? Ah, Warhol's portrayal of celebrities, it's like gazing upon stars that burn bright, yet are so distant and cold. His Marilyn, repeatedly immortalized on canvas, is a haunting echo of fame's fleeting beauty and life's transient nature. These faces, they remind me of wheat fields under troubled skies, 
full of emotion, yet somehow immensely empty. But Vincent, do you not see? Warhol exposes the absurdity of our obsessions. His Marilyn, his Elvis, their icons trapped all of serial reproduction, devoid of essence. It's a jest, un cruel jeu, reflecting society's own vacuity. My own Le Demoiselle d'Avignon, it broke boundaries because it confronted the viewer, challenged perceptions. Warhol, on the other hand, presents a mirage, a reflection devoid of substance. Such frivolity in reproduction, it lacks the divine touch of creation. A sculptor shapes the marble, infuses life with each chisel strike. These portraits, while they captivate the masses, hold not the soul's weight. In the Sistine Chapel, each figure tells a story of faith, of humanity's fall and redemption. Warhol's work, A Celebrity Worship, signifies nothing but hollow echo, glorifying mortality instead of transcending it. And yet, there lies innovation in his technique, an exploration of popular culture as a mirror to our collective psyche. My studies of human anatomy were driven by a quest for understanding, capturing the essence of man. Warhol's repetition perhaps symbolizes the mechanization of human existence, an era where everything, even human uniqueness, is mass-produced. This, in its own right, can be seen as a commentary on mortality and the fleeting nature of fame. The emotional depth, I must argue, is missing in these stark reproductions. When I painted the Rouen Cathedral at different times of day, I sought to capture the fleeting essence of light, its impermanence. Warhol, in duplicating celebrities, overlooks the subtleties of emotion and light, rendering a surface-level interpretation of his subject's souls each perspective as unique as the brush strokes on a canvas. Warhol, through his exploration of celebrity and mortality, provokes us to question the value we place on fame and the inevitable shadow it casts. Does the replication of an icon in his work dilute its essence, or does it immortalize a moment, a person, beyond their mortal confines? In the end, perhaps it is the discourse he ignites that is his true legacy. Pablo, you've shattered boundaries much like our subject today. How do you perceive Warhol's influence in the pop art movement? Warhol, ah, he sees the world as a canvas of repetition, much like my Le Demoiselle d'Avignon. He disrupts. Yet where I sought to dismantle the form, he dismantles the content. He takes the mundane, the soup can, and elevates it. This to me is a revolution, not of the brush, but of the mind. A revolution, you say? My David, my Sistine Chapel, they were born of sweat, blood, and divine inspiration. Warhol's cans, the product of a factory. Where is the soul, the divine spark, in his assembly line of art? Ah, but Michelangelo Monami, do you not see? Warhol's factory is his chapel, his assembly line, his congregation. He worships at the altar of the everyday, finding beauty in the banality. This is his divinity, his creation. Fascination with the ordinary, indeed, signifies a shift. My Vitruvian man balances both art and science, an exploration of divine proportion and human form. Warhol's exploration appears in duplicating what already exists, and yet, does not this repetition ask us to see anew, to question the essence of what we behold daily? I must interject. My water lilies capture the fleeting nature of light, the ephemeral beauty of the pond at Giverny, each painting unique, even as the subject remains the same. Warhol's repetition, it's cold, mechanical. Is there beauty in this repetition, or is it merely a reflection of our consumerist society's emptiness? Your water lilies, Claude, they speak to the soul, offer solace. Warhol's work, it jolts, confronts, it speaks not to the pastoral but to the chaos of celebrity, of consumption. Yet in that chaos, is there not truth? In his repetition, a mirror to our own obsessions? Justement, Vincent, Warhol, like a true artist, holds up a mirror to society. And what do we see? Do we not recognize ourselves in his Marilyns, his soup cans? Warhol does not just show us art. He shows us who we have become. And what of craftsmanship? Where is the artist's hand in screens pulled by others? In my time, every chisel mark, every brushstroke was a testament to the artist's skill, to his connection with the divine. Perhaps, Michelangelo, our definitions of artistic hand expand with time. Was not my experimentation with oils, my endless curiosity, once considered radical? Warhol's screen printing, his assembly line of images, could it not be a modern extension of our own attempts to innovate within our craft? It seems then, gentlemen, our discussion reveals Warhol as both mirror and mallet, 
reflecting society's image while chipping away at our traditional notions of art. In this, perhaps, lies his greatest contribution to the evolution of art, pushing us to question, not just observe, to engage, not merely admire. Let us delve into the fascinating evolution of subject matter in art. We observe the transformation of the everyday object into an icon through the work of Warhol. Michelangelo, does this trend herald a degradation of artistic value? A question most astute, yet fraught with complexity. In my days, marble breathed under my chisel, each stroke a testament to human grandeur. The mundane, the quotidian, how can they rival the divine form of David, the piety of the Pietà? A soup can, a box of Brillo pads, such objects lack the grandiosity, the spirit. It is not the subject that ennobles art, it is art that should ennoble the subject. Ah, but Michelangelo, mon ami, you miss the forest for the trees. Have you not seen the beauty in the quotidian, the ephemeral play of light on water lilies, the subtle grace of a sunrise over the Seine? I see in Warhol's work a similar pursuit, to elevate the everyday, to find beauty in the banal. Campbell's soup cans and Brillo boxes, they are but lilies in a different pond. And yet, both of you dance around the flame without getting burnt. The selection of subject, be it a woman, a landscape, or a soup can, is but a canvas on which we project our questions. Warhol, like me with my demoiselle, jolts the viewer out of complacency. Art does not diminish when it takes the everyday. It merely holds up a mirror to our own existence, no? Intriguing how we spin around the axle of subjectivity. In my studies, in the codices I filled, there was always a pursuit of knowledge, of unveiling the world's intricate design. Warhol's subjects, be they mundane objects or icons of consumerism, are not the antithesis of art, but rather a continuation of this exploration. The question is not of what is portrayed, but how and why. Does not The Last Supper elevate the act of dining as much as Warhol elevates his Campbell's soup to an object of contemplation? Exploration, contemplation. But where is the soul, Leonardo? Your Last Supper pulses with narrative, with divine significance. A can of soup, it sits there, static, lifeless. Ah, but life, Michelangelo, is made up of such static moments, is it not? Warhol sees the world anew, painting not the mythic or the monumental, but the mirror of the moment. Is there not a certain purity, a beauty, in acknowledging the ordinary? The beauty in the ordinary. Claude, your words resonate within me like the stars that dot the night sky. In my own work, I sought the extraordinary in the ordinary. Fields, starry nights, sunflowers. Yet Warhol's work, does it not strip away the emotional, the personal touch that comes with the artist's hand? Where I sought to imbue my canvases with my soul, does Warhol not detach, making the impersonal the personal? Ah, Vincent, but there lies the provocation, detachment as commentary. Warhol's detachment is itself an emotional gesture, a reflection on our society, on the commodification of emotion and art itself. It is a mistake to see his work as devoid of personal touch. Rather, it is the very essence of it, encapsulated in the impersonal. Let us delve into Warhol's audacious use of color, a choice that veers far from tradition. Michelangelo, your critique. Indeed, Rembrandt, my soul finds itself at a tempest's mercy at the sight of such frivolity. In the Sistine Chapel, each hue chosen bespeaks divinity, painstakingly employed to elevate the spirit. Warhol's riotous colors, a cacophony, an assault on the senses that lacks the depth and piety of true art. Fie, how is the sacred art likened to Warhol's cow series? mere novelty. Ah, Michelangelo, you speak of depth, yet you overlook Warhol's mastery in challenging our perception. In The Last Supper, I too played with color to bring forth a narrative. Warhol's flower series does not mock the observer, but invites them into a realm where color evokes the modern psyche. His work whispers, the world changes, and so does what art signifies. Should we then remain chained to the past? Both of you, in your quarrel, miss the simplicity that color can bring to the soul. Remember my starry night, where the swirls of blue and yellow carry one's emotions into a dance? Warhol, with his colors, does not seek to mimic nature, but to celebrate emotion and reflection in a world bombarded by the artificial. His colors scream, his art a beacon in the night. Yet here we argue if his light is bright enough. True, 
Vincent, and let us not forget the role of interpretation in art. Warhol's colors, much like my own water lilies, serve not to replicate the world, but to offer a lens through which we might see it anew. His flower series, bursting with color, invites us to reconsider what we look upon every day and see the extraordinary in the ordinary. Ah, my friends, you circle around the truth like moths to flame. In my Guernica, I show the horror of war through the stark absence of color, while Warhol bathes his subjects in color to mask the emptiness within. His cow series is not just color for color's sake. It is a mirror to our souls, showing us the vacuousness of our modern existence. You call it an insult, Michelangelo? I say it is a revelation. A revelation, Pablo, a pall veiled over our eyes. Art must uplift, not demean. It should challenge the soul to rise, not wallow in the mire of mundanity. His use of color is but a jest, a child's play compared to the grandeur of the Renaissance. Yet, Michelangelo, do we not all play the child, curious and bold? Warhol's use of color challenges the dreariness of convention. Is innovation to be shunned? I dare say, his exploration leads us into new frontiers, much as my own inventions dared to do. And in challenging the world, we see the world anew. Warhol's colors, though controversial, forge a path through the bramble of tradition, illuminating a new way of seeing. Indeed, every stroke, every hue, elicits a dialogue between the canvas and the observer, a dialogue ever-changing with the light of day and the shadow of night. So let us not scorn the innovator, but rather embrace the challenge laid before us. In art, as in life, color speaks where words fail, echoing the breadth of human emotion across the canvas of our days. The passion of your discourse mirrors the very essence of Warhol's work, provocative, unyielding, and reflective of the human condition. Let us then consider his approach not as an affront, but as an invitation to explore the uncharted territories of our own perceptions. Let us delve into the shadows that art casts, the morose melodies it can play on the soul. Warhol's exploration of death and violence, a mirage reflecting our inner storms. Michelangelo, your David stands eternal, a beacon of life. Contrast this with Warhol's gun series. What say you? Ah, Rembrandt, you thrust me into a tempest. My David, sculpted from the heart of Carrara, is a symbol of divine beauty and strength, una lata eterna. Warhol's gun, on the other hand, is but a shadow, a fleeting moment of despair cast in color. Where I carve life from stone, Andy paints the macabre dance of death on canvas. It's an insult to the very essence of creation, an abhorrence. But, Michelangelo, do you not see? In darkness, there lies beauty as well. My starry night whirls with the same madness that seduced Warhol's trigger. Both of us, prisoners to our demons, yet what emerges is pure, unbridled emotion. Warhol's gun and my night skies, they are but two sides of the same coin, a reflection of humanity's quest for meaning amidst chaos and despair. Vincent, mon ami, your words sail through the night like a ship on troubled seas. Yet, I find Warhol's depiction of violence devoid of the subtle touch, the light that dances upon the water lilies in Giverny. His work lacks the nuance, the delicate balance between light and shadow. It is blunt, crass even. Where is the beauty in a machine of death? Warhol has not captured life's transient nature, but rather its abrupt end. Ah, but Claude, isn't that the point? Warhol forces us to confront the unthinkable. The societal embrace of the gun is totem as icon. My Guernica screams in the face of violence, a chaotic symphony of agony. Warhol's gun is silent, yes, but its silence is deafening. It speaks of the end, the finality of life. He slices through convention, much as my cubist perspective fractures reality. We must applaud him for daring to disturb the waters of complacency. Pablo, your fervor matches the flames of hell itself. Yet, let us not forget, art is a mirror to nature, specchio dell'anima, the soul's mirror. Warhol's gun series, and indeed his portrayal of death, does not reflect the intricate patterns, the Fibonacci sequence found in every corner of the natural world. It is cold, detached. While I meticulously detailed every curl in the Mona Lisa's hair, Warhol reduces life and its cessation to mere symbols. Is this reduction not an oversimplification of the profound mystery of existence? Gentlemen, your passions ignite the air itself. Warhol, with his garish colors and stark symbols, indeed strips the nuance from death. Yet, is there not truth in his candidness? 
In my The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Nicholas Tulp, I too depicted the stark reality of death, but sought to find beauty in the science, in the learning. Perhaps Warhol invites us to contemplate, rather than to simply gaze upon. Contemplate? Contempt is more apt to reduce the grand opera of life to cheap, mass-produced icons? Folia! And yet, does not our conversation prove Warhol's power to incite dialogue, to provoke, to anger? In this, his art becomes a gun itself, not ending life, but igniting it with fervor. True, Vincent. And though we may splinter like rays of light through Monet's beloved water lilies, each taking our path, we converge in the pond below, united in our quest to understand, to express, to evoke. Splendid. Through our discourse, we have traversed the valley shadows cast by Warhol's contemplation of death and emerged perhaps with a deeper appreciation for the light. Gentlemen, let's tread upon the terrain of mixed media, a method Warhol wielded with impudence. Leonardo, you've dabbled across various disciplines. What are your thoughts on this avant-garde fusion Warhol has brought to canvas? Ah, the query you pose stirs within me a whirlwind of contemplation. In my era, the purity of form and medium were paramount. Yet, in verita, I cannot help but admire Warhol's audacious melding of materials. It's akin to the alchemy of transforming lead into gold, a sorcery of the visual domain. The silver car crash reveals not just the metallic sheen, but the cold, sterile embrace of death using modernity's own fabric. A sorcery, you say? Bah! Warhol turned the canvas into a battleground of the mundane and the commercial. In my Guernica, every stroke, every form bore the weight of despair, of war's absurdity. Warhol's mixed media? It is but a mirror to a society ensnared by superficial glamour. Gold Marilyn Monroe, iconography drowned in the gilded tides of consumerism. He celebrates what we should condemn. Both of you speak of alchemy and battles, yet miss the essence of mastery. In sculpting David, I freed him from marble. Warhol cages real torment and passion behind layers of ink and paint. Is there emotion in this technique, or merely fascination with the medium itself? His series dilutes the potent agony of existence into marketable aesthetics. Emotion. Michelangelo? Warhol's silver car crash trapped the agony of mortality within its silver embrace, a tableau of modern alienation. And yet his seas of silkscreen provoke a storm within me. The repetition, the stark palettes. There's a madness there, a repetition of despair not unlike my own starry night. He both masks and unveils the human condition. Ah, but gentlemen, consider the impression he leaves upon us. Warhol, like myself with my Water Lilies series, plays with the observer's perception. His mixed media is not a barrier, but a bridge, a tender crossing over real and abstract. We observe gold Marilyn Monroe, not as a mere portrait, but as a beacon through the fog of our own perceptions. A tender bridge, Claude. Warhol builds a scaffold to nowhere, festooned with the trappings of a society obsessed with the hollow and the ephemeral. True, my works have provoked, but always with purpose, to reveal the spirit, the struggle beneath. Warhol reveals nothing but the garishness of the surface. Yet, in this garishness, as you call it, Pablo, do we not see the reflection of humanity's own evolving facade? In Gold Marilyn Monroe, Warhol has not simply presented an icon, but dissected her, laid bare the layers of fame, beauty, and ultimately tragedy. It is a modern memento mori. Dissected, perhaps, but where is the soul? My creations in the Sistine Chapel breathe speak of divine comedy and tragedy, Warhol's canvases for all their mixed-media cleverness whisper only of cold, distant echoes. They are the noise, not the music. And so we find ourselves at the heart of a paradox. Warhol's mixed media, a convergence or a divergence from the essence of art. He adorns the surface, yet casts a shadow on the depths beneath. As we conclude, let us ponder. Does Warhol's technique illuminate our world, or does it mask the truth that art seeks to unveil? Provocation in art, mes amis, is as natural as the urge to breathe. Warhol's Mao, splashed with irreverence, challenges us as the Minotaur challenged me. It spits in the face of authority, and oh, how vital that spit has become. But to deface an image, even in the name of art, carries a weight. Your Minotaur, Pablo, tangled in its own labyrinth, at least was birthed from myth. Warhol's Mao, however, draws from a living well. 
to mock the visage of authority, is it not to trivialize the suffering under its yoke? Gentlemen, it's the conversation between the beholder and the peace that holds true significance. Whether it be a provocation or a whisper in the halls of the mind, it's the spark of thought that art ignites, which is paramount. As I sought to capture the soul through the sfumato in the eyes of the Mona Lisa, so too did Warhol seek to capture the zeitgeist, though with a louder voice. Loud indeed, and at what cost? There is a line, fine as a hair, between provocation and mockery. Whilst I poured my agony and ecstasy onto the canvas, creating starry nights from my own turbulent psyche, Warhol's portraits, do they not border on the cynical? Whither goes the sincerity in art? Sincerity, Vincent. In the modern world, sincerity is as fleeting as the light upon my water lilies. Warhol shows us the mirror, our obsession with celebrity, with the iconography of power, it is not beauty he replicates, but the absurdity of our own reflections in society's pond. Ah, Claude, and in that reflection, do we not see the farce of our own existence? Art's role is not to please the eye, but to jolt the complacent mind. As I broke faces and reassembled them in cubism, so did Warhol disassemble the icons of his time. But where is the divine spark in such provocations? In the Sistine Chapel, I toiled to bring man closer to God. Warhol's cans of soup... What heaven do they aspire to? Michelangelo, mio caro, not all search for heaven. Some art roots in the earth, in the mire of the now. As I studied the veins of a leaf and the mechanics of a bird's wing, so did Warhol study the ethos of his era, the commerce, the celebrity, the iconoclasm. Perhaps there is a method to the madness, a swirling galaxy behind the seemingly banal. Just as my night sky swirls above the quiet village, Warhol's work, in its provocations, its blaring colors, forces us to confront our own stars and shadows. Yes, Vincent. But let us not forget, in the end, the artist must decide whether to illuminate or obscure, to provoke thought or to descend into the abyss of desensitization. Warhol's taboos, are they a beacon or a black hole? A question, Claude, that each beholder must answer. As artists, we cast our dice upon the waters of society, chaotic and ever-changing. Warhol's art, like mine, is not a gentle stream, but a torrent that shapes the landscape anew. So it seems, gentlemen, that our quest to define the role of provocation in art remains as complex and varied as the works we create. As we ponder Warhol's place in this continuum, let us remember that the resonance of provocation lies in its ability to endure, to incite discourse across the echelons of time and thought. We now venture into the territory of Warhol's legacy in contemporary art and culture. His fixation on the transient has undoubtedly sculpted the modern creative landscape. Yet how has this influence manifested in the realms of multimedia and digital art? Warhol's canvas was not just his silkscreen, but the concept of art itself. Like my cubism shattered the conventional, Warhol's ephemera blurred the lines between high art and popular culture. He saw art in soup cans, the mundane became sacred. Yet in today's digital rush, are we embracing the superficial, mistaking the rapid for the revolutionary? Monet et Warhol, a curious juxtaposition, don't you think? My water lilies, the subject of endless fascination, captured the essence of natural beauty through light and reflection. Warhol, on the other hand, saw beauty in the commercial, in the transient pop of a soda bottle. Il a fait du quotidien une célébrité, much like the digital art of today, transforms the ordinary with a single click. Still, I wonder, does the depth of a pond not stir the soul more profoundly than the fizz of a coke? Observing Warhol's legacy through the prism of science and art, his replicative method mirrors the reiterative processes of innovation. His dollar signs, ubiquitous yet provocative, force us to contemplate the value we ascribe to art in the digital age. But have we not lost the tactile, the connection to the artist's hand? Is not the essence of creation found within the stroke of a brush, the carve of a chisel, rather than the cold click of a mouse? As a sculptor, the concept of replication to me is as foreign as the notion of creating without feeling. Warhol's Brillo boxes might be art, but where is the divinity? Where is the soul? Our Sistine Chapel painstakingly brought to life, brush stroke by brush stroke, could never have been a product of mass production. The digital age, inspired by Warhol, perhaps embraces a form of art that eludes my grasp, for it lacks the breath of God. 
Warhol painted the fading stars, the Maryland diptychs, whispering of mortality beneath the glamour. Like my starry night, they speak to the temporality of existence. Yet in this current embrace of digital and multimedia art, are we closer to capturing the fleeting moments of beauty, or are we simply lost in the replication of replicas, far removed from the emotional depth that art is supposed to invoke? Ah, Vincent, but is not the purpose of art to provoke? Warhol's celebrity portraits and my own Guernica, though vastly different in medium and message, both challenge the observer to look beyond the surface. The digital age has the potential to democratize art, to challenge societal norms even more broadly than Warhol could have imagined. Yet the question remains, does the message endure, or is it lost in the cacophony of the digital agora? Notre combat est contre l'effacement de l'individuel dans l'art. The personal touch, the brushstroke, the unique perspective, these are what endure. Warhol's legacy is not just in what he created, but in the conversation he continues to inspire about what art is and could be. Truly the crucible of time will test the works of today as it has ours. Warhol's exploration of the ephemeral, his celebration of the ordinary, challenges future generations to find beauty and meaning, not just in the timeless, but in the time-bound. As we engage with the digital, may we not lose sight of the human, the divine spark that animates all true art. So we find ourselves at an impasse, questioning whether Warhol's focus on the ephemeral has enriched our artistic dialogue or led us astray. His influence is undeniable, shaping how we perceive and interact with the art of today, digital or otherwise. Yet the core of our discussion reveals a longing for the authentic, the human touch amidst the omnipresent digital. As we conclude, let us ponder on Warhol's question of what art is, and indeed, what it can be. Remembering that it is the conversation, the debate, the questioning that keeps the essence of creativity alive. We gather now at the culmination of our discourse to reckon with the enigma that is Warhol and the indelible stamp he has pressed upon the fabric of art. Warhol challenges us, urging us to ponder, what is art? What perchance can it become? Let us navigate these restless waters with open eyes. Warhol, ah, he smashed through art's confines like I shattered perspective. But where I sought the soul beneath the surface, Andy celebrated the facade. He held a mirror to society, yet what reflection did we truly behold? Art turned commodity, celebrity, a fleeting whisper in the clamor of consumerism. Is this the legacy we embrace? The future we envisage for our craft? In Warhol's repetition, I see not the divine spark that drives the chisel through marble, but a machine's cold embrace. What fervor, what piety can be found in the endless mimicry of soup cans? Art should elevate the soul, stir the depths of man's being, not reduce his divine expressions to the mundane transactions of daily commerce. With all due respect, Michelangelo, your view is as constricted as the perspective from which you refuse to shift. Warhol's repetition and embrace of the everyday object challenge us to see beyond the surface, to find beauty and significance in the ethos of our times. His work is a dialogue, an inquiry into the nature of perception, identity, and the very essence of art itself. Indeed, Leonardo, and let us not overlook the transience captured in Warhol's flowers, a fleeting beauty stark against the backdrop of his more mechanical musings. There is poetry there, a reminder that even in our modern age, where everything is reproduced ad infinitum, the ephemeral moment still holds power, still captivates. Friends, you speak of surfaces and depths, of fleeting beauty and eternal truths, yet miss the heart of the matter. Warhol's work, is it not a mirror to our own souls? Are we not all seeking connection, meaning, amidst the chaos of modern existence? Yes, he commodified, but so too did he question, unsettle, provoke. His legacy, troubled as it may be, pushes us to confront the very essence of our art and our humanity. What more can art strive to do? Vincent, while your passion moves me, I must contest. To equate the unsettling provocations of Warhol with genuine introspection is folly. He played the provocateur, yes, but to what end? Was there enlightenment to be found in his taboos or merely the hollow echo of scandal for scandal's sake? Scandal indeed seems to be the currency of your realm, Picasso. Yet, can we not discern a trace of divine in even Warhol's most brazen provocations? 
Does his exploration not force us to confront the gods and monsters within our own nature? Both of you in your dispute illuminate the path forward. Art, be it Warhol's or ours, must continually provoke, challenge, and inquire. It must be the flame that ignites discourse, not the ash that smothers it. Warhol's legacy, complex as it may be, has undeniably sparked conversation. Is this not the essence of what art can and should be? Let us not forget, amidst these heated words, that the legacy of any artist is not merely in the work left behind, but in the eyes that behold it, the minds that ponder it, and the hearts that feel its impact. Warhol has indeed left his mark, prompting us to question and to seek. Then let it be said that our journey through the landscape of Warhol's legacy had been fraught, yet fruitful. We've clashed with words and wills, yet emerged with a richer understanding of not just one man's art, but the enduring question of what art itself embodies. As the shadows lengthen and our colloquy draws to a close, let us part with minds broadened and spirits enlivened by the vigor of debate. Warhol's canvas was vast, and within it, we find not only a reflection of society, but also a mirror to our own souls. Let this discourse serve as a testament to the power of art, to provoke, to question, to unite.